Welcome, everybody. I'm going to just give it a moment as um, coming in from the waiting room and your computer is adjusting to our uh, Zoom program. I am um, glad you're spending some of your afternoon with us. In fact, um, Robert and I were just uh, discussing today, I think, is the perfect day to have a virtual program. You are all uh, safe and warm and dry at home. Um, and we're able to bring uh, today's uh, special program to you uh, without having to step outside. Um, anyway, I hope you all are doing uh, safe and well and glad you're joining us. Uh, my name's Jeff Zay. I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator with the Port Washington Library. Uh, I do wanna make note, I'm going to turn on the closed captions feature. Um, you can turn that feature off though, if you don't wanna see the, uh, the subtitles at the bottom, there is a CC live transcript button on the toolbar and you can just choose hide subtitle. Um, we, uh, as usual, have um, you muted during the presentation part of the program, uh, but of course, as always, you can type any questions you may have into the chat and we'll make sure we have time to go through those at the end. Um, just a, a brief update more, uh, we have more uh, virtual only, uh, hybrid and in-person programs uh, coming to you in the coming weeks and months. Um, and just please make note of, for example, today is just a virtual only program. Uh, we also have uh, some programs that we've begun over the last month, which are hybrid, where we have both an in-person audience and folks uh, enjoying it on Zoom at the same time. So please just uh, make note of, of the uh, types of styles of programs that we're, we're offering in the coming weeks. A um, couple of notes about some upcoming programs. Uh, tomorrow, um, Sunday at 2 p.m., and again, I'll just take note, as I was uh, earlier, uh, we do turn the clocks ahead um, overnight tonight. Um, so at 2 p.m. tomorrow, um, we're very happy to be hosting the Something Special Big Band. It'll be live in concert uh, on our stage. Um, and they are one of the New York area's uh, finest swing and jazz bands, well known for their bassy style of music. This will be a hybrid event. Um, I think there may be a couple of uh, seats still left. And we also are live streaming it uh, over Zoom. So priority seating again will be for Port Washington residents and, and card holders. Then on Tuesday at 12 p.m., we have a art lecture with Alice Schwarz, a museum educator from the Met. Uh, she'll be discussing the art and life of Georgia O'Keeffe. And this program is uh, part of the Library Celebration of Women's History Month. That will be a hybrid program. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that evening at 7 p.m., our very popular vegetable gardening series continues with part three. Uh, we're up to the planting stage and there'll be discussion of square foot gardening. And then next Friday, the 18th at 12 p.m., our Sandwiched In, which will be just an in-person only program, will be with Monica Randall, who will be exploring the legendary women of Long Island during the Gold Coast era, um, including areas and, and residents who used to live here in Port Washington and, and Sands Point. So anyway, let's get right to the reason you're here today. I want to tell you a little bit about our presenter, award-winning professional chef and culinary nutritionist, Dr. Robert Delamore, founder of The Power of Food, brings experience and passion when delivering his cooking demonstrations. Having presented in 22 states, including Alaska, he demonstrates nutritious and tasty ways to bolster immunity and brain health, as well as prevent obesity. As always, Chef Delamore aims to make his dishes salt, butter, and sugar-free. And we're very happy to welcome Chef Delamore back today with a special program on knife skills. Take it away, Chef. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. It's a pleasure and an honor to be working with Jeff Zay and Port Washington Library. Uh, very near and dear to my heart, I'm from Nassau County, Rockville Center, and I have friends in Port Washington. I taught in Port Washington schools, uh, cooking classes in adult ed. Uh, I love Port. Uh, it's really, really important for me to be here to present my skill set, my teaching on knife skills. Um, this is what I do professionally, uh, almost 20 years now, teaching children, teens, tweens, and adults uh, healthy eating through 
uh, life skills and through delicious food. Jeff Zay was kind enough to invite me to bring the, the skills component to what I do with the cooking. And uh, this was a recommendation, I believe, or a request, I'm sorry, from one of the patrons here. So uh, again, I want to say thank you to everyone coming out and tuning in. <clears throat> You want to have a pencil and pad, you're going to want to take notes, uh, things that are super cool, things that are different, uh, things that you can use right away. I think you'll agree this is going to be a great, great class. Okay, let's do this. Uh, in the morning, first thing what I do is uh, invariably I'm having yogurt with fruit uh, three, four, five days a week. This is my go-to breakfast. Uh, I prepare the fruit ahead of time. The night before, I have an individual Tupperware, and then I just serve the yogurt, and I can even take it to go. It's wonderful. I'm going to show you how I like to prepare uh, my fruits. Uh, this is my banana, perfectly ripe. What I like to do is teach kids that they can use the banana uh, the peel as a cutting board, you see? First knife I'm gonna demonstrate is with my ceramic uh, uh, slicing knife. So this is smaller than a chef's knife. It's called a slicing knife, uh, larger than a paring knife though. So you see the difference in the sizes of my knives here, okay? <laughs> this is one of my favorite knives, uh, my uh, eight inch um, Henkel blade. I've had this for almost 20 years. This is a nice cleaver that I like to use. This is, of course, my 10 inch chef's knife. Amazing, amazing weight, amazing balance. Uh, of course, my serrated knife. And then I have another, uh, my Yoshi blade, which my daughter gave me for Father's Day about 10 years ago. I love it. It has its own sheath here. And then a couple of other cool uh, Henkel serrated knife. Cutco serrated knife, look at these cool knives, and another serrated knife here. Now, Jeff mentioned that uh, to me that the most important knife or utensil in the kitchen is the chef's knife, and I agree. Um, I would ask, like to ask you, what do you think my second favorite utensil is? Okay, it's not my serrated knife, it's not my paring knife, it is my peeler, okay? And I'm using this every day. So I have a couple of different peelers here. This is another gift my daughter gave me. <laughs> She's amazing. Uh, this is a cool peeler, super sharp, okay? Really fast, easy to clean. Uh, of course, my ox, ox, ox grip, good grip. And then I have another cool peeler here I wanted to share with you. This is what I like to shred my carrots with, okay? You get these little matchstick shreds with the carrots. So this is a, a serrated blade, super sharp. It's got a plastic protector here and this is awesome for shredding the carrot. I recommend this highly. I, I, I add this to my salad every day. Okay so the peeler is my second most important utensil because I'm constantly peeling vegetables, eggplant, um, sweet potatoes, whatever, uh, and fruit all the time. Apple. Okay if I don't buy organic. Okay so let's get back to this banana and breakfast. Okay so what I have here is my, I wanted to share with you this little trick I like to incorporate. I like to have a Tupperware nearby and I place the, um, any refuse right here so I'm not constantly going back and forth to the garbage pail. So I have this handy here. So what I have here is if you don't have cutting boards, you can use the skin of the banana as a cutting board. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slice this super, super thin and super fast. And this is fun to have the kids do this uh, who can slice the most. Uh, what we do is we check the skin here. You see how many slices I got out of this one banana. Okay, so of course I'm gonna include this banana with the potassium uh, in my yogurt. Another fruit I'm going to always have every day is my apple. So what I like to do is take my paring knife and I'm just gonna rotate the apple in my hand and not move my hand, you see? And I guide the knife with my thumb. So this is a great way to get 
um, independent of actually using a peel, if you don't have one or if you're, uh, the one you have is not sharp, get comfortable with the paring knife. And again, our organic apples, we're gonna keep the skin on, but our inorganic, if you need to uh, peel, you can use the knife like so. Okay, the paring knife. And I love this, these ceramic blades. I've had them over 15 years. They never need sharpening. They're pretty incredible. So what I like to do with my apple is this. I'm gonna, for myself, I'm gonna slice half the apple and uh, actually in quarters, right? But just two quarters of the apple. So I'm gonna save this apple in Tupperware. Then what I like to do is I like to cut through this apple like so. So I'm going to, it, it's gonna allow me to get um, nice little dice, you see? By, by holding it like so, I can just dice right through this apple. Okay, so I'm gonna make strips first and then dice it and again, this is what I'm talking about for breakfast in my yogurt, okay? Some blueberries, some mango. Okay, what about pineapple? Because I love pineapple. And as you can see, I have a couple of pineapple here that are in my refrigerator. And I've had these for literally weeks. And what happens is they just get riper and riper and riper and riper and riper. They never go bad. Okay, they're refrigerated and the skin is on. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna show you right now what to do. Okay. So when you go to the supermarket, you don't pull the leaves out and see if it's ripe. Okay, I, uh, that's, that's what I used to do. And again, this is uh, the way a lot of people tell if the, if it, uh, the stage of the ripening. Don't do that. Just grab the biggest one you see. And then bring it home and let it sit on the counter. One, two, three, maybe four days and watch it start to ripen. And you can check and pull and see how ripe it's getting. Okay, if it's starting to get ripe, what I'm going to recommend is you take your serrated knife, you lay it on end, and you cut across. Now, you can twist this top off, but it's not going to give you a nice flat top like this. And the reason why I have this nice flat top here is because what I'm going to do now is invert this and allow it to continue to ripen upside down. So if, uh, if, um, if I could, I would ask you, why do you think I'm doing this? Okay, so when the um, grapefruit, um, the pineapples in, in this position, all the sugars, the majority of the sugars are towards the bottom or base of the uh, pineapple. So when you invert it, now you're allowing the sugars to go back and uh, sweeten the rest of the pineapple. Trust me, this works. Okay. Now, second important part of this is keeping the skin on. Okay. So by keeping the skin on, I can literally have the, um, I, I can keep the pineapple in the refrigerator for weeks on end, just continuously getting riper and riper in the refrigerator. Let me go back a minute. What I do is once I top it like I just did, then it's just gonna stay on the countertop maybe one more day. And then it's gonna go in the refrigerator and it's gonna stay there. When I want the pineapple uh, to serve it, what I do, and again, I have different ones here because I just love, I have them on hand all the time. But what I like to do is I like to take the pineapple like this, and remember, when it's super sweet, you don't have to cut big sections off. So I just slice it like this, and then it goes back in its Tupperware, and that, or on a plate, it doesn't matter. Just uh, remember, the skin is protecting it. Back in the refrigerator, and what I'm gonna do is take my knife and just slice around the stem, slice like this. This is absolutely the easiest way and best way to keep the pineapple. If you, Peel it, it will turn into two days, three days. Now I have my section here with my core. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice on either side of the core, then turn it and slice again, either side of the core. And now I've got my core here, okay? Now I'm gonna slice through these sections again 
and just cut them into small little dice like this. Now, this is what I'm talking about. So sweet, you have to try this tip and technique in purchasing, preparing, processing, and cutting it so that it, it lasts for weeks on end, literally in the refrigerator, continuously getting riper. Okay, so let's do this. This is gonna go over here. Okay. Well, I've got my fruit all ready for tomorrow now. Okay. My apple, my pineapple, that could go in my salad tonight. Okay. So now let's do this. We're going to switch this up a little bit. And let's demonstrate what I like to do with my uh, mushrooms. Okay. So I have these baby bell mushrooms that I have wipe down with a dry paper towel. I like to keep them open like this in a container in the refrigerator. Uh, what I want to do is give myself, this is a round object, so I want to make it flat. So I cut it in half, and then I can just slice through it easily like this. And if you'll notice, when I pick up the chef's knife, my hand, my thumb and index finger are on the blade, okay? And it's not here. The first two fingers are on the blade, okay? And what we want to do is be able to control the blade with our auxiliary, which is this hand right here. Okay. So again, I want to slice it thinly so that it cooks faster and better. Again, slicing thinly like this. Gives me a nice flat edge. I can then place that down like so. Notice when I move fast, I move towards the tip of the blade. You see? I can even take my ceramic knife, even my paring, and just slice it like this. And I prefer the mushroom sliced nice and thinly. I never buy them pre-sliced. They charge you more for that many times. It's crazy. Okay. And these mushrooms will stay in the refrigerator sliced like this for a day or so. If you want to cook them, saute them with garlic. Okay. Speaking of garlic, let's get right to it. Okay, here's my head of garlic. What do we do with it? How do we separate it? We can pick it apart or we can just push like so, and it just breaks apart off for us, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our garlic cloves, and we're just gonna simply use our knife and crush them, and now we're going to have the skin come right off, okay? Just a simple press of the side of the knife, I love to peel the skin off with my fingers. It's, I've been doing this for so long and I love it. Now, what I like to do is take my garlic and I like to do two at a time. I'm gonna slice it super. slice it thin it's it's almost already minced when it's sliced so thin then you can take your knife and rock it like so okay. so in less than a minute i have two cloves of garlic minced that would be perfect for my pasta sauce for my marinara sauce for tomorrow two cans of tomatoes okay now let's do this Okay, speaking of tomatoes, let's, I want to show you what I like to do with the tomato. Okay, I always cut the tomato on a Tupperware top that has a lid, uh, the lid has a rim around it, and I really love this. It works super well in keeping the juice. So watch what I like to do. I'm going to top the tomato and you see the tab here in the middle, 
the stem, I'm going to slice on either side like I did with the pineapple, then turn it either uh, 90 degrees, and then I'm going to remove this little stem. Okay, that goes in my garbage. Now I've got my diced tomato. Perfect. Now, this guy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my fingers like so, and I'm going to slice across. You see, I'm just holding it on the top, slicing across almost all the way through. I haven't sliced all the way through, so it's staying together. Then I slice on top, holding it on either side, and then come back and dice the tomato. Now you see that any juice coming out of this tomato, any seeds, they're all caught by the lip of this the rim on my Tupperware top, okay? I love using this to cut tomatoes grapes, olives, anything round, cherry tomatoes. Okay, that's gonna go in there. Okay, I did forget one thing. I'm gonna ask you to give me one second. Excuse me, one second. So no class on knife skills would be complete without a demonstration of slicing of the onion. I think you'll agree with that. So I, I'm so sorry, I've got the plate uh, table this onion. So let's do this. We're gonna take our onion. We're gonna prep it like this. We're gonna take the top off on one end, then the top off on the other, and then I slice through the middle. And there's a million ways to do this. This is the way I like to do it. Then I take my, hand and I'm just going to peel off this outer layer. Okay, now by slicing it in half, I've made a round object flat. You see? And you get down as far as you need to, to the nice firm one. Okay, now two ways to slice this. I'm going to place my finger on top of the blade and I'm going to go three quarters of the way to the end here making small slices about a sixteenth, eighth of an inch apart. Okay, I've kept it intact by keeping this end intact. Okay, and then just pushing across. And we have a quick dice. I don't believe there's an easier, quicker way to do this. Okay, nice, beautiful dice. That's one way to prepare this half of an onion. What if I wanted to slice it super thin and super fast. I'm gonna take this guy because I like to use the weight of this blade to slice through this. And super thin. And super fast. So when you slice it thinly, you can see the knife through the onion. Okay, and this is gonna cook faster and better. It's gonna caramelize up nicely. If you're roasting the onion, of course, you're not gonna slice it thin like this. You're not gonna dice it. Okay, another invaluable tip on how to prepare your aromatics. Okay, let's do this. Let's this here, and let's move on. Okay, so, um, in general, I will dice the onion if I want to hide it. Um, if I want to feature it, I will slice it. And again, roasting it, you're going to slice it a lot thicker than that. Okay, now we're going to move on to another vegetable that I absolutely love, which is cabbage, which is uh, something that I have literally every day of my life. I have salad with uh, either organic kale or uh, spinach and cabbage. Uh, a half a can of beans, red beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, black beans, uh, northern beans, uh, any combination of beans. Sometimes I add two different beans to the salad every day, okay, with my raw ginger. Okay, what I want to show you, uh, I want to get to the ginger in a minute too, but what I want to show you is, you know when you buy the um, the cabbage and you have the outer leaves and you peel them off and you throw them away. No, do, do, do not do it. You want to rinse them off, okay, as I've done here, and then you just fold them in half like so, okay? And then you can slice them. Okay. 
prefer just gently pushing. You can even pull the knife. And you notice how my finger moves to the top of the uh, knife here. Now the knife is an extension of my finger. Okay, I love to the cap. Cancer fighting benefits. Cabbage is all the precipitous vegetables. The Brussels sprouts, the cabbage, the kale, collard greens, broccoli, cauliflower, right? Now I'm just going across the green here, and this is the way I love to prepare the cabbage for my salad. Locking the knife. And this, these are the outer two layers of the cabbage that can be tough. By chopping it very small like so, you're just blending it in with the, everything else, okay? Okay. Now. Jeff, okay. I just want to interrupt here for just one sec. I think because of the way the audio is working for Zoom, when you're doing your uh, really repetitive chopping, we're yeah, losing the... You no, know, we're just losing your audio as far as like yeah. what you're saying. So if you can just make sure any instruction that you're giving us, it's before or after the rapid chopping. Thank you, Jeff. I'm sorry. No problem. Thank you. I'll, I'll remember that. Okay. So no talking while I'm chopping. Okay. So now let's, what, what else, do, how, do I, how else do I process this? Okay. I'm going to take this like this. What I like to do is I like to take it like so. Now I'm going to show you two different ways to prep this. Um, what I like to do is cut from the inside out. I'm going to take my fingers like so, they're in the back here. Then what I do is I move from this position to this. From here to here. And by doing so, um, what I found is that, uh, and a lot of uh, teachers of knife skills say never to put your finger on the blade. But this technique works amazing. By doing so, now I'm just cradling the knife handle here, and there's no force in my upper arm. Not like this. By doing this, I've, I've turned it slightly, and I have my finger here, and this allows me to go very thinly and slice very thin shards of this coastal, of uh, this um, cabbage. If you notice, very thin, and if I go like this, I'm going to go very deep. So by going like this, this is a technique I came up with that really allows you to go very thin and it's also a great way to peel vegetables like eggplant, okay? Even cucumbers, okay? But again, holding it like so, um, and again, shifting my hand here allows me to just use the, the, the sharpness of the blade to just get nice thin shards. I want everybody to try this and tell me that is not one of the coolest tips that I shared with you today. Okay, once I have it here, I'm going to just slice it like so. And again, this is the way we roll in my house, featuring the cancer fighting prevention, the crunch, the uh, incredible texture of this cabbage combined with the kale and the organic spinach. Okay. Let me talk to you about this kale really fast. So what, how do we process it, this? And this is really important, okay, I think, to share how I like to process the kale. Really fast, I'm gonna pull this. So I wash this and uh, I've actually soaked it, shook it dry and then air dried it, okay? Now I'm gonna uh, take this stem off here just by holding it and then just ripping it off. Again, another great, um, activity for kids or grandkids to do. Just take off the stem here. And I have one last one here. I'm just gonna pull it off. Okay, so you don't need any knife skills to do this, right? Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this off. That's what I'm gonna do. Ooh, use this, okay. So I have my kale here, which I place in the palm of my hand and I make a bowl. And I do this every time I process the kale. Make a bowl and squeeze it. And you can take your stress out on the kale. Okay, you know, just, uh, okay so your knuckles are white. Now what I'm gonna do is place it back on the cutting board and I continue to put the pressure, keep the pressure on the 
kale and keep it condensed. And this will allow me to slice it thinly like so. Now, this is a chauffinade, very thinly sliced. You see, almost whisper uh, thin kale. And this is accomplished by keeping pressure on the kale and my knuckles are 90 degrees to my cutting board. So I can slice this very, very thinly, okay? Really the, the trick to being able to chop quickly like this is keeping these fingers at 90 degrees at all times, okay? But this is what we end up with, wisps of the kale, which are incredible combined with the cabbage, the ginger. It's amazing. What about my spinach? Okay, so I like to serve the spinach chopped up as well. So I'm gonna take this and everybody notice that I had a piece of paper towel in here to collect the moisture, which is what I do always with my fresh herbs and my greens. I like to process this uh, spinach the same way. I make a bowl and then I just chop it up. And if you prefer, nice and easy. Different way to prepare your fresh spinach, okay? You see this top here? I can take this like this. This is cabbage. This is pretty hard stuff, but um, pretty firm. But with a nice sharp knife, you can move through this quick. Okay? Okay. So we demonstrated the mushrooms. Uh, let's do one more vegetable here, which is gonna be my strawberries. Okay. So what I like to do with my strawberries is, okay. so these are organic strawberries, of course, right? Only buying organic strawberries these days, right? The uh, conventional strawberries are on the top of the list of the dirty dozen. So avoid them. The dirty dozen is, of course, our list of produce that has a lot of chemicals and pesticides. So we can take my, uh, I like to take my slicing knife or my paring knife. What happened to my paring knife? Right here. And we're just, what I'm going to do is I'm going to place my finger on top of the blade. Now the blade is an extension of my finger, and I like to top the strawberry. Okay, like, like so. Then I turn the tops right side up, and I keep them like this, and then I can just slice around this like so. Same thing here. These little uh, pieces here from the tops are the perfect size for the fork, and the, the it's beautiful, it works beautifully in a salad, having these little pieces of the strawberry here, and then this goes away, okay? Then I'm gonna take the knife and pull through the strawberry and then splay it. Just slicing thinly like so. Using the tip of the blade, a lot easier than using the breadth of the blade, right? And just pulling, you see my arm is going backwards, and this is the way I love to prepare my strawberries. Okay. okay. Running out of cutting boards here. Okay. Next, we did the kale, we did the spinach, we did the fruit. Let's get to the meat and potatoes of this program, okay? So, what I'm going to do here is demonstrate with a gloved hand, what I like to do with my chicken. And um, I have prepared for us both uh, some chicken thighs and also some chicken breasts. Okay, I'm gonna show you two really great techniques for using the knife, getting comfortable and saving money. Okay, so Jeff and I were talking prior to the program. 
how we both think this is a really timely program to save money, to be able to cook at home, not be dependent on eating away from home. Uh, if you have the skills to be able to prepare a meal, and of course the meat protein is essential for us, right? Or protein is essential for us, right? And most people get that protein from meat. So let's look at a lean meat source, the breasts, okay? The first one I'm gonna show you here, I have two beautiful breasts, and I want you to be able to uh, see clearly this demarcation line here on the top of the breast. So I've cleaned all the fat, and you can see the tender line here. Look at this. This is the most tender portion of the breast. It's a totally different uh, quality of the meat. The chicken is much more tender. It's called the tenderloin. It does attach to the ribs of the chicken. And what I like to do is cut right across that. So I take my knife, my finger on top of the blade. Now the blade is an extension of my finger. And I, sep I separate the tenderloin from the rest of the breast. I'm going to go ahead and do this on this other one here. Okay, here's my tenderloin. Here it is here. I like to do um, different things with this, make nuggets with it. I'm gonna show you how to fillet this breast now. So it comes out perfect every time. Now, you'll see chefs always showing uh, pounding of the chicken and making it flat. Uh, pounding of the chicken breast or the, uh, the white meat chicken. And it does not tenderize, it just flattens it. I'm gonna show you how to make it perfect a perfect thin fillet every time. And the trick is to keep your hand on top of the, show what I'm talking about. keeping your hand on top of the <laughs> breast like so, okay? Let me do this. Let's see with that. So we're gonna do this. Okay, let me do this right here. Okay, we can do this a little bit better. Okay, placing your, hand parallel to the cutting surface. And again, I like to place my hand here. I'm gonna slice thinly like so. And I do have a little bit of upward pressure so I don't go too th thick. And this is what is produced, a beautiful fillet of the breast, okay? Now you can fillet this and then freeze it and then cook it when you're ready to. Uh, I like to fillet this and then put it in an egg wash and let it sit in the refrigerator for an hour or two, the egg tenderizes it. You could also tenderize this with yogurt. Uh, this is what I love to do with my dark meat. But by slicing this thinly like so, and being able to do this independent of anyone else, you know, now that you're talking skills here, to not only be able to save money, but the food tastes incredible. When you slice this thinly, there's nothing like it. You can cut this chicken breast as a cutlet with a fork. And these funny looking ones, yeah, these always taste the best. That's what I used to tell my kids when they were little. And I tell all my junior chefs the same thing. Okay, again, just putting a little pressure and keeping my hand across, a parallel to my cutting surface and slicing across. Okay, these are gonna be delicious, nice and thin. I can egg these and um, bread them and make a nice cutlet. Or I could just put these in a saute, a stir fry or a saute with onions and garlic. And this will cook in two seconds because it's so thin, okay? So that's one breast. Now, what about the tenderloin? So what I like to do with the tenderloin is I like to slice them. I'm just gonna clean off this little fat here. And again, when you're cleaning this chicken yourself, you'll see what, what I do with this thigh you're making sure you're not eating any connective tissue, fat, it's fantastic. Now, what I like to do is I like to slice this tenderloin into nuggets and make these the best chicken nuggets you've ever had in your life, because it's the tenderloin. Uh, I'm gonna egg and bread these the same way I would the cutlets. Delicious, again, this would be fantastic in a stir fry or just saute it in a little oil and garlic or onion. Uh, what, what spices do you want to put in here? Coriander, cumin seed, um, uh, turmeric, uh, what, 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 anything, oregano, uh, black pepper, a little salt. Okay, these are my nuggets with my tenderloin. And uh, this meat, let's say I want to freeze this or refrigerate it, it'll be ready to rock because it's been cleaned perfectly. 
This again can be refrigerated or fro refrozen. And then when you're ready to cook it, it's ready to rock. Okay. So let me do this, clear this out of the way. Last thing we're gonna go over is the chicken thigh. And I love teaching this. So I have my thigh with, with the skin on, and then I have these that I've already cleaned, you see? Beautifully ready to rock. Let me show you what I like to do uh, fast here from the beginning, from the, from the get-go. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna always have my one hand with a glove. When I do a chicken at home, I use a glove. And you notice that I don't have a glove on this hand, that's because your knife hand never ever touches the meat, ever. It gets slippery, it's also cross-contamination, right? Never needs a glove because it's never touching the meat, okay? If you need two hands to pull the skin off, you glove both hands or you wash them before you touch this knife, okay? For safety reasons, uh, you don't want this hand slippery at all, okay? So now with my skin off, I just, do this, I like to clean this fat here. And I developed a little technique where I just kind of pull the fat away, the knife's nice and sharp. Um, and I'm able to just, you have to keep your knives sharp. Um, there are a couple of good knife sharpness here in Suffolk County, in Nassau County as well. Um, in, the, in, in, in between your sharpenings, you can use your steels, of course, I love this cool steel here, isn't that cool? Okay, very old, still works. This is a Wusthof uh, steel, $25, the best there is out there. Okay, now, if you notice, I've removed my skin and I have my bone in the thigh here. And now what I want you to also notice is that I'm going to have uh, a sheared knuckle, it's sheared through the, to separate and section the chicken parts, they shear through this joint here and they keep this one intact. So this one intact is gonna be away from me and the flat one is gonna to be towards me so I can place my thumb right up against it, okay? So again, it looks like this. On my cutting board, my thumb is here and I'm gonna place two fingers on either side of my bone. Watch what I did. I'm gonna just take my gloved hand and I'm going to use the, my, my fingers to clear the, bone, the meat from the bone. When you use your fingers and not the knife, you get all the meat off. Okay, then what I do is I place two fingers underneath the bone like this, and literally with my hand and the edge of my blade, I can debone this thigh in 15 seconds, okay? Now, here's my bone with the clean, clean bone, no meat. I've got a little meat here, and then we have this guy here. Now this is what's called the pearl. This is the pearl of the thigh. This is the most tender portion of the thigh. You serve this to those you love the most, okay? Um, this, I'm going to just take like this, and it's gonna go delicious in my, uh, in my stir fry or my, my curry, wh whatever I'm gonna do with this, okay? These bones are reserved, frozen, and kept uh, in the freezer for when I wanna make stock. In the meantime, what do I do with this guy here? Okay, we're going to remove all of this fat here. You've got a huge fat pocket here. You've got uh, connective tissue here. Uh, you got this guy up here. So what I do is I put my finger on top of my blade and I like to use the tip of my blade. You see, I'm using the tip. Very easy and manageable to work with the tip of the blade. Okay, so again, like so, I just remove all of this uh, fat or connective tissue. And now what I like to do is I like to use my fingers to really clean this out. When you see how much connective tissue comes out of this thigh, I think you'll want to debone the thigh every time you eat it, okay? So what's great is this comes right out, okay? Again, I'm just using my, not my fingers to clean this out. Then again, with my finger on top of the blade, using the tip of the blade, I'm just gonna take out this, look at this technique here, I've got my finger here. 
We're gonna get in here nice and thin and remove this big fat pocket right there. You see that? So this is a much leaner piece of meat right here, uh, less fat in the pan when you cook it. What I like to do with this thigh is either use the air fryer or the stovetop or roast this in the oven. Uh, you can do it like this, or you can slice it in thirds like so. And you can actually make a delicious, um, look at this. This is a beautiful uh, piece of dark meat here that's gonna cook up and be delicious, no matter how you marinate this, okay? Garlic, onion, yogurt, balsamic vinegar, olive oil, some turmeric, some cumin seed, some coriander seed, um, just absolutely delicious. Okay, um, what, if you like, I'll show you one more time how to debone the stuff. It's ready to rock here. What I'm going to do is take, I have two knuckles, one that's intact and the other one is sheared through. That sheared through and I'm gonna place towards me and place my thumb right up against it. Then I take two fingers and I hold the chicken in place with my knife and with my fingers, I can remove all, of, it comes right off. The meat comes right off the bone on either side. Then I jiggle my two fingers underneath. Again, it separates right off the bone. There's no meat on this bone. I'm not dulling my knife on the bone. And again, just by holding it down and pulling, it comes right out. I slice off here around the cartilage. We don't want any cartilage in our stir fry or curry. And then I have, the, this meat is gonna be beautiful in a chicken stock when I cook it, uh, boil it for stock. And what about this guy here, the tenderloin? I'm sorry, the pearl, that's coming off here. And this is, again, the most tender part of that dark meat. Here, once I get it like so, I'm, doing, I'm not gonna use my knife. I'm going to instead, I'm gonna use my fingers to separate different muscle groups, and then pull out this nerve like so. Comes right out. And let me tell you, you do not miss this when you're eating this chicken. It's clean of any connective tissue, clean of extraneous fat. And don't forget this fat pocket here, which I'm gonna come in like so and just remove this. You can't access this fat or this connective tissue this connective tissue and nerves, unless you debone the thigh. Uh, not only are you cleaning this chicken of any of the fat and connective tissue, it's also gonna cook in a fraction of the time now that you deboned it. If you cook this with the bone in, it's gonna take twice as long, maybe three times longer than if you cook it like so. So again, this is how I like to prepare the chicken thigh. I demonstrated the chicken breast. I also shared with you a couple of tricks and tips on prepping and preparing your fruits and vegetables. You know what? I'm going to ask you to indulge. Let, let me show you one more cool trick because I really think it's worth it. Okay, this is going to go over here. Okay, two, two important cool tricks. Okay, so I have some frozen bread here. It's actually the first amount. But what I want to share with you is a little trick. So I like to take my bread and freeze it so that it maintains this, this nice thick, the thickness is maintained. If you cut this when the bread is soft, it's gonna scrunch down. Rather freeze it and use your, uh, your serrated blade to cut it thinly with thick, and it's gonna stay nice and uh, big. If you cut it when it's soft, it kind of mushes down like this. So I had it frozen but it started to defrost, so I'm not gonna show you that. Couple of another, a couple of other cool tricks I wanna share with you. Okay, we're gonna take this like this. I wanna show you a really foolproof method of serving this orange, sliced. Okay, so what I do is I slice through it like so. And you'll see the pith in the middle here. If you slice in the middle of the pith, you're gonna have pith on every wedge of orange. If you go just to the side of the pith, you slice through on each, at each level, you just go to the side and then you take this top one 
You see you're gonna have perfection here with these wedges, no pith. Let me show you again. If I go in the middle, I'm gonna have pith. If I go to the side, you see it's orange slice perfection. Look at this. And this is another way I like to start my day. Tons of vitamin C. You can do this with a grapefruit. I think that, that's it. I'm out. Uh, any questions? Any comments? I want to say thank you again. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Chef. Um, we, we do. We have a number of questions here. Um, <clears throat> and again, some great tips uh, beyond just the knife skills. I really appreciate you passing those along. And just before I go through the questions, I just want to remind everyone, we have, uh, and I want to thank you, Robert, for letting us record today's program. Um, we will uh, edit this and get it onto our YouTube page. And for those um, interested, we have at least, uh, I think, three previous cooking demonstrations uh, by Chef Delamore that are on the library's YouTube page. Um, I'll put the link to that in the chat in just a minute including your chicken cutlets and chicken nuggets program, which you were referencing there um, uh, when cutting up the chicken. So let's get started on some of the questions. Uh, back to the pineapple here, and that's a really great tip, I have to say again, uh, to how to preserve yeah. it. Um, so somebody asks, uh, once a pineapple is harvested, ripening ceases, is that true? Um, I... I would, I'm not sure about that because when you, uh, what I've experienced is when you, if you cut into the pineapple too early, it's not right. By letting it ripen, inverted like so, the ripening rapidly increases and progresses. And I promise you, if you try this technique, keeping them in the refrigerator like so, this pineapple, just get sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Again, the refrigeration is key. So um, I would say no to that because I, this is the way I found it to be uh, clinically. <laughs> I found it, the, the pineapple definitely right. Got it. Uh, another question, can lemon juice be used on apple slices to prevent browning? Yes, of course, that's an old trick. Um, if you pre-slice the apple, um, lemon juice will prevent it from oxidizing and turning brown. Certain apple varieties brown faster than others, um, but lemon juice is great on the apples if you prep them and process them and refrigerate them. I love the combination of the lemon and the apple. I have lemons on hand every day. Great. Um, question about mushrooms. Do you pull the stems off of mushrooms? Okay, no, I'm using the mushroom stem. If you have, if you buy larger stuffing mushrooms, that stem is chopped up and, and goes right into the center of the stuffing with the cheese and the breadcrumbs and roast peppers, whatever you like to add to your stuffed mushrooms. I never throw away the mushroom stems unless they're a little too far gone. Okay, if they've, uh, if they're, if they're too soft, I'm going to destroy them, but typically I always use the stem. Um, you know, I'm, I'm using it nine out of ten times. Okay. Uh, another question now about uh, the cabbage. Is there a difference between green cabbage versus red cabbage, and is there more nutritional value in red cabbage versus green no, cabbage? No, I believe that both of the cabbage are equally nutritious, um, the red and the green. Um, what I like to share with a couple tips when you talk about the red cabbage. If you're prepping a salad with red cabbage and you want to have leftovers, don't use red cabbage. You use the green cabbage. The red cabbage will bleed into the other vegetables, discolor them red or pink. And uh, I found that out with experience. So if you like to prepare food the way I do, which is for eating and then always having a little leftover. I like the green cabbage, but I have red cabbage in the refrigerator right now and I use it all the time as well. Um, some people say that more color, more health. So the red is more colorful, but I believe that both are equally uh, nutrition, nutritious. Please look up cruciferous vegetables and cancer prevention, five words. Just Google that, cruciferous vegetables. Um, 
and everyone knows why they call these vegetables cruciferous vegetables, because the two, the first set of leaves in all of these plants are the form of a cross, and that's why they call them cruciferous vegetables. I thought that's cool to share with you. Got it. Good. Uh, so we do have some more questions, and Stephen Duncan, I see your hand raised. We'll just get to you in just a, a moment. Um, what type of kale do you uh, use or prefer? There are different types of kale, uh, lacinato, dinosaur kale, common curly kale, and more. I will uh, utilize any and every kale item that I see in the grocery store. If it looks fresh, red kale, I love it. Uh, it's processed the same way. You're removing the stems. And I really love this technique. I've never seen anybody serve it like this way. Uh, producing a thin chaffinade like you would do with fresh basil. Um, and it changes the texture of the kale completely. It pairs perfectly with the crunch of the uh, cabbage. And another interesting thing about the kale is this. If you try to chaffinade uh, romaine lettuce, uh, arugula, um, it, it, it wilts down to nothing. Uh, whereas the kale will hold its, uh, it will retain its crunch, but yet um, it's very fine. And it, it, it's, a, it's a completely different um, textural experience. And I've been serving this to kids prepared like this for over 15 years. I've worked in 22 states, including Alaska, serving Native American kids a salad with kale like this. And they absolutely go crazy because they don't realize they're eating kale. It's chopped so fine. And the crunch of the cabbage is the perfect marriage. Um, a related question, uh, how would you slice the cabbage to make coleslaw? The same exact way, the same way I demonstrated. So you're gonna take your knife again and you hold it like so, right? This is your typical way to hold it. Okay, I'm gonna just take it like this and my fingers on top, on the side of the blade, I'm just holding the knife, cradling it so you can go very thinly, okay? Works every time. Just slice thinly like this to make your coleslaw. <laughs> It'll be the best coleslaw you've ever prepared. Very thin. So that's another another cabbage related question. The core of the cabbage, do you use it or toss it? No, I toss it. Okay. I, I will use the core and the stem of broccoli, uh, cauliflower. I'm boiling that. I'm sorry, I'm boiling it or steaming it. Uh, and I love to serve that as well. Great. Um, I'm going to get to some more questions here in the chat. But Stephen uh, Duncan, you've been waiting a bit, so uh, you can unmute yourself now. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Um, Chef, did I hear you say before that you can refreeze a chicken that's been frozen before? And can you refreeze fish? Yeah, I've refrozen chicken before. I have never refrozen fish. I've never refrozen fish. But I have refrozen chicken. I don't like to do it often, but I've, I've done it. Okay. Um, another question, this is again versus uh, uh, the subject of organic versus non-organic. If a fruit has a skin to peel, um, uh, this person has heard there's no benefit to purchasing organic, adding that it's usually just more costly. Is that accurate as far as uh, skin? So, yes, so, so the strawberries uh, have no skin and they must use a lot of pesticides on these delicious, delectable fruits. Otherwise the insects have their way with them. So there's no protection for the fruit, the flesh of the fruit. So you want to stay away from conventional fruits without a skin. Those with a skin, you can purchase uh, and just peel the skin and you will be uh, safe from the pesticide because the, the skin is, uh, the pesticides are located in the skin, the majority of them. So uh, conventional apples, again, you're gonna peel them. Uh, organic, you can take advantage of the benefits and the nutrients in the skin, just more costly, and uh, it's your choice. Great, uh, now back to knives. Um, someone's wondering where you buy your knives and they had heard a long time ago to look for three rivets uh, with the blade going through the length of the handle for weightiness yeah. and balance. 
and to get a stainless steel blade stamped with eight slash 18. Can you explain um, some of what that is? So you have different, okay, excuse me, I dropped this. Okay, so here are my three rivets and the blade is going through the handle. You can see here, uh, so this is a real workhorse. Work this is my Henkel blade I've had for over 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely love the weight and the balance of this knife. Um, it does have a, a, a little indentation here for your pinky, but my hand is never all the way down there. It's always more on, on the knife uh, blade itself here and towards the front of the handle. So when you have a blade that goes through the handle, nothing's going to break, okay? Nothing's going to separate. Um, this knife is very special, but all of them are. Um, look, when you purchase, uh, so there's a company online, Cutlery and Company, I believe it's called. Bed Bath & Beyond is great to order online. If you have a problem, you can bring it right back to the store. Um, so I like to order online when I and, and deal with manufacturers or uh, companies that I can go back to if I have a problem, I don't have to send it back. And if you can, that's the way I like to roll. Uh, even this old cleaver has the two, three uh, rivets and then the, the blade through the handle. You see that? Um, again, you have Japanese blades like this that are special. Uh, different, lighter, uh, and again, it's all about the feel of the knife. Any other question? Hey, yeah, um, another question. Uh, again, this was about chicken, and I guess uh, marinating it. That um, can place the chicken in buttermilk for a couple of hours to tenderize it. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Buttermilk, milk, eggs. Uh, yogurt, I have been favoring yogurt, uh, just a tablespoon of yogurt. Uh, first, I marinate the chicken in balsamic vinegar, olive oil, and my different spices that I want to incorporate in that dish. And then I will tenderize it with an additional layer of yogurt. It goes in the refrigerator an hour or so. Uh, in the air fryer, it's amazing. Uh, in the oven or on the pan, I really love the yogurt, and I think it's a bit healthier than the butter. Less, less saturated fat. Got it. Uh, another ch uh, chicken related question. Is the pearl also referred to as the oyster? Yes. But yes. I forgot that name. Well, I, I refer to it as the pearl. Yeah. Um, so a question about the, uh, I believe the steel rod that you had mentioned there. Uh, the person has a question that um, does that actually sharpen the knife or does it more just sort of straighten out the, the blade? Yeah. Is there a difference between that and other sharpening devices? Yes. So this is not sharpening and rather what it is doing is aligning the, um, the blade. Um, so what, what, when we use the knife, the teeth on the blade misalign and the steel helps realign the blade. So it makes it sharper and uh, great for use uh, just before you're cutting into some steak or some chicken, whatever. Uh, if you have a lot of processing, I'm always gonna use this ahead of time uh, before I use the knife. Uh, in between, um, I'm gonna do this in between sharpening the knife, which I do every six months commercially now, I don't know if someone do it, or you can purchase uh, sharpness at home um, but I go, I haven't been done professionally. Got it. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is how, uh, obviously the ceramic knives, as you mentioned, they don't need sharpening, but for the other knives, uh, either there's obviously services out there that can sharpen them. Is there anything you recommend for something at home for, for sharpening? I, I have no, Jeff, I'm sorry. I have not experimented with home sharpening uh, devices. Okay. So I can speak to you on that. I apologize. No problem. Um, let's see. Uh, another question. How do you cut fresh ginger? Well, I wanted to show you how I do the fresh ginger. Okay, so I'm processing the ginger every day. I have ginger tea in the morning, every day with fresh lemon. Hot filtered water, boiling water. I actually have the 
ginger juice and already prepped in my freezer and my uh, ice cube tray. So I popped those out along with uh, some fresh lemon and that's a tea I have every morning. But every time I prepare uh, my salad, what I do is process the ginger like so. And you'll notice I have <clears throat> a flat edge here. So what I will do, uh, I never use a spoon to peel the ginger. I just take my trusty peeler. And again, I use this instrument every day of my life. The peeler is truly my favorite utensil after my chef's life, okay? Um, and I love the paring knife as well, okay? And once I take the ginger like so, then what I do is I slice it like this, okay? And again, I'll just clear this off, okay? What I found is that you can take the ginger and slice it super thinly, as thin as you can. I like to use a lot of ginger, okay? So very thin, and then I continue to slice it. So they're like matchsticks, okay? And in about 30 seconds, I can mince this ginger and have it ready to roll. Just turning it 90 degrees, holding it together with my hand. And the aroma right now is insane, of course. Those of you that love to put pair the ginger. It takes no time when you have the tools and the skills to do this. This is the amount of ginger I'm gonna to add to my salad. And um, it's a lot, but I'm going to also have a lot of ingredients in my salad. Kale, cabbage, um, olives, tomatoes, blueberries, uh, carrots, avocado. I like to add beans, at least a half a can of beans to every one of my salads. And then I have this nice batch of fresh ginger. Remember the raw ginger, maximally nutritious. The raw cabbage, maximally nutritious. The kale and spinach, of course, maximally nutritious. Um, and then what, what I always do is um, always have a little bit of my salad left over so that I can come back and add maybe uh, a little bit of kale, a little bit of cabbage and stretch that extra leftover salad. And that's when I really love that extra ginger that I put. So that's how I like to process it, fast, furious. Um, any other questions? Yes, uh, let's see. So in terms of the, the steel, the uh, honing steel, can you just yes. demonstrate perhaps what the best technique is for using that? I'm just gonna take it like so. And I have my finger like this. And that's it, okay? Just at a nice angle so that you're realigning the teeth on the blade. It's, um, it really makes a big difference and you would notice right away in a tomato, cut through the tomato skin. Everyone knows that tree. So were you going across the, the steel I'm rod or down the steel rod? And I'm at an angle of about 15 degrees. That's it. Okay, and again, I don't do it too much because I really want to, when you do that, you're taking off metal. So you wanna, you wanna handle these knives uh, judiciously, not go crazy with the steel, not go crazy with the sharpening. Well, another really important thing I wanna mention is these knives never end up in my sink or in the dishwasher. You know, a lot of people, they're cooking, they put everything in the sink and they're gonna wash. These knives are washed immediately after I'm done. Or I wash them with all the rest of the dishes and that I want to wash. And then they're dried and put back in the drawer. They never sit out wet. They're washed and dried right away, right after use, and they go in a dedicated drawer just for all those uh, chef's knives. It's really great. Um, so again, another related question, if the knife honing takes off a little bit of metal, you wouldn't want to do it over any food, correct? You want to do that over the sink or some other surface. Uh, and then uh, do the ceramic knives require using the, the honing steel? Is that, no. uh, or they do not? Does not go near the honing steel. 
Uh, so the ceramic knife never needs sharpening. And I want to just talk about this really fast. So the ceramic stone is 10 times stronger than the steel. They use ceramic stone to sharpen steel blades. So super strong. They're, uh, they're very brittle, though. If you drop these, they can chip. The end of the knife can chip. Um, but uh, what, what the ceramic allows you to do, number one, it's super lightweight. Number two, never needs sharpening maintains its sharpness because it is ceramic stone. Uh, I have had these 15, 20 years, never sharpened them once. Incredible. Um, and you can buy these now at Costco BJ's. They have packages of them, uh, $10, $20. Um, purchase them, they're a great investment. I love them because they're very light. Yeah, I just got a set recently as a gift and they're terrific. Um, so The gift that keeps giving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you ever recommend a garlic press or a ginger grater? Uh, so I have my um, my microplane here, and I meant to talk about it. And some people like to use the microplane with the ginger, and I don't. I just like to mince it. I never use a garlic press. Uh, some people love to do that. I just prefer mincing it. I have the skills. I've been doing it for a long time. I'll mince the garlic and put it in a uh, ramekin and then in a Tupperware and keep it in the refrigerator when I want to use it. I have it ready to rock and roll. Doesn't smell in the refrigerator because I have it in a Tupperware container. Uh, so garlic press, don't use it. It's a personal thing. If you prefer to do that, it's fine. And the microplane, um, hardly ever use it. Uh, it's it's uh, out there for those that can't mince the ginger or don't want to mince the ginger with the knife. Great. Um, so there's a couple other questions regarding the salad you were just mentioning in terms of what was in that salad you were just describing and then uh, what the ingredients are for that dressing, salad dressing you mentioned. Okay, so my salad is, oh, I, I have never bought lettuce, romaine lettuce, iceberg lettuce, never waste my money. I stay away from arugula because it's very perishable. I love arugula. I make an amazing arugula salad, but I really stay away from it. Very perishable. If anything, I will buy long leaf arugula with the dirt, with the roots on. If any of you are familiar with that, that's an insanely spicy, pungent arugula flavor, which I absolutely adore and love and love to serve. But typically I have organic kale and cabbage and kale in my salad, either kale or cabbage, uh, either kale or spinach, always paired with the cabbage and my ginger. And then I go crazy with fruit. Any fruit, invariably I'm throwing some pineapple in there. That's maximally ripe. Some mango is delicious. And again, uh, you, you do whatever you please. It's a personal thing, uh, experiment with different um, textures again this this marriage of the kale and cabbage is wonderful and that's my base of my bed for the salad red onion all the time uh, roasted peppers or fresh peppers in that salad and any fruit that you like but the basis of it is the combination of the kale and the cabbage for a dressing i'm just going to keep it simple balsamic vinegar and uh, olive oil maybe some fresh lemon juice on top doesn't get much easier than that. Great. Uh, let's see. So there is a couple people commented they really enjoyed the tip about the uh, slicing the orange uh, to avoid the pith and the, the pineapple. Uh, so great tips there. If you try that, you will not believe how wonderful it tastes. And people comment on it right away. Uh, why does that orange taste so good? Because there's no pit. Yeah. Uh, and another, one more question here. I heard um, to massage the kale uh, makes it less tough to chew. Uh, I didn't see you do that. Do you recommend massaging it? Never, never done it. So if you're going to serve the kale with big chunks of kale like this, if you rip it or cut it big like this, um, I don't know about massaging the kale. I've never done that, but I don't want to eat the kale like this. I, and I love kale, 
but I really love it chopped up very fine. And everyone I've ever served that to has said that is just absolutely the most amazing way to serve the kale. Uh, chopped up very fine. And again, uh, if you squeeze it into a bowl, maintain that bowl you can, and the pressure with your fingers, you can slice it very, very thin. Try it. Try it. You don't have to worry about massaging. Great. Um, another question here. How many days does it take you to finish cabbage and kale? Or is there um, way, good ways to preserve what you are... Um, after you've chopped what you need, what, how you keep it? Great, great question. So um, the cabbage is stored in the refrigerator in my fresh drawer. Stays like this. Doesn't go bad at all. If it starts to discolor, I discard those pieces. The kale and the spinach is always stored with a paper towel. Now you can see the moisture on this container. And when you go to buy your kale or cabbage and if it's in a plastic I, I don't buy anything in a plastic bag plastic bag is the worst thing for the greens I prefer the plastic container or no container is better but if there's a container uh, what I do is I take the spinach out and then I put a paper towel down put the spinach back in and then I have it like so if I'm not resourceful enough and don't want to take it all out. I'll just have the spinach here and I'll put this on top and then turn it upside down. So now you're, you're removing that moisture barrier uh, because the paper towel will absorb the moisture and that will triple the life of the green. So you could do this with any green, any of your fresh herbs, you wrap it in paper towel, not wet, dry paper towels. Paper towel absorbs the moisture that's naturally diffused out of the greens in the cold environment of the refrigerator, you have to use a paper towel. This will be your second best trick that I taught you today after the pineapple. Great. Okay, I think we just got uh, maybe one or two more here. So regarding the prepackaged, um, you know, pre-washed lettuces, uh, you're just referring there to the to the clamshell type packages. Uh, so yeah. someone's asking if you know do, they do cost more money and can save time. Um, is there any other you know, issues as far as the prepackaged, pre-washed lettuces? No, 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 no. They're, they're, uh, stick with the plastic. When you buy them, don't look at the top. You know, turn it over and look at the back and pick one that has the least amount of moisture. Um, when you bring it home, as soon as you open it, to, uh, open it to use it for the first time, use the paper towel trick. Um, I stay away from the plastic. Uh, the plastic bags, I'm sorry, and just incorporate that paper towel, you will see big dividends on that, uh, triple the life of the greens. Great. Well, I know we're getting a little off the, the subject here. Uh, just another question here. Do you put herbs in your salads? Uh, I don't add fresh herbs to my salad. I like the herbs and the spices in my cooked dishes. Uh, my salads have so much flavor, number one, from the ginger, number two, from the ripeness of the fruit that I add, and then this insanely healthy and delicious combination of the, and the crunch of the kale and the cabbage. I don't add fresh herbs to my salads, only to my uh, cooked dishes. I like to add herbs to my um, marinades. I favor oregano. Love the coriander, love the cumin seed, toasted and crushed in a mortar and pestle. Uh, and I love to add those spices to my meat dishes, of course, but not to my salad. Got it. And last question here, should vegetables be stored on high or low humidity? Um, I don't know that answer. Okay. I have never adjusted the humidity in the refrigerator. I just try to keep the veggies away from the coldest sections of the refrigerator because certain, uh, certain vegetables will not do well if they're super cold, bordering on uh, a freeze. So keep the veggies away from the coldest sections. I like to keep my meat in those colder sections of the refrigerator. Um, but the humidity, I don't, um, I don't know that answer, sir, I'm sorry. 
No problem. Well, uh, Chef, I got. I want to thank you again for again terrific program today. Uh, thank, thank you for your patience uh, and, and taking all of those questions. I did right. add the uh, link to the library's YouTube page into the chat so you can uh, check out some more of Chef Delamore's uh, previous programs. We're uh, going to be uh, working on uh, bringing Chef Delamore back for some more programs um, and continue to uh, bring you um, <clears throat> cooking skills, recipes, uh, the whole work. So we're, we're so glad you're able to spend some of your afternoon with us. Again, perfect day for a virtual program. Hope everybody enjoys the rest of their weekend. Stay safe and warm. And, and thanks again, Chef. Jeff, I want to just say thank you again to you and to everyone coming out. Um, thank you. Without you, we couldn't do this. And if you like the program, please let the library know. Just say, love the program. Helpful, informative going to use these techniques. This is what Jeff wants to hear. Uh, so that feedback is essential. Thank you. We we'll look forward to seeing you in the coming months as Jeff and I put together some more programming. So thanks so much again. Great. Terrific. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks again.